sort of introducing exhibits, some of the arguments about the exhibits that where we haven't reached agreement, playing some videotape depositions in order to lay the foundation and, and put the exhibits in, and then to, to play uh, several of the um, excerpts of videos, it would probably take about 90 minutes, and that will be the last thing we do before we rest. And so I just wanted to give the court a sense of it for planning today. I'm not sure how much more cross-examination there is left, but we were thinking we would be resting our case today. So if um, the witness finishes his testimony 90 minutes or so ahead of 4 o'clock, you'll be done with your case? That's correct, Your Honor. All right. Well, that gives us a target to shoot for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Nielsen? <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor, and I appreciate that target, though I think it may be unlikely, Your Honor. <laughs> well, just, we can always be hopeful. <laughs> but ho hope springs eternal, Your Honor. Yes. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Herrick. Good afternoon. Could you turn to tab 19 in your witness binder? Can you identify this document? Well, you'll find a doc document pre-marked DIX 1266. And can you identify this document? Um, this is a, well, this is the text of an article. It's not actually a copy of the article in its original form, uh, but it's the text of an article titled Definition and Measurement of Sexual Orientation by John Gonsiorek, Randall Sell, and James Weinrich that was published in a journal called Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior in 1995. All right, thank you. And uh, are you familiar with this document? Um, I believe I read this document some time ago, probably close to the time it was published. All right, thank you. And the, this first, uh, the authors discuss a number of uh, difficulties with measuring uh, sexual orientation, and then uh, if you could turn to page four of the exhibit, and uh, at the start of the bottom paragraph, the authors write, quote, given such significant measurement problems, one could conclude there is serious doubt whether sexual orientation is a valid concept at all. Do you <coughs> believe that is an unreasonable statement that one could seriously doubt whether sexual orientation is a valid concept at all. It's the top of the uh, paragraph that starts at the bottom on the f of the fourth page, Your Honor. Oh, yes. <coughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Well, the, the first sentence says, given such significant measurement problems, one could conclude there is serious doubt whether sexual orientation is a valid concept at all. Do you believe that one could conclude that there is serious doubt whether sexual orientation is a valid concept at all? Well, I think that they're raising that as mostly a rhetorical device in the article, because if you read down a few sentences to the end of that paragraph, you see uh, them saying, regardless of these philosophical debates, most present-day North Americans tend to label themselves as homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual, despite the fact that these labels do not capture the full range of complexity of sexual orientation and sexual identity. So characterizing it as a philosophical debate, I think that they're raising it you know, as a way of discussing some different positions, the social constructionists and the essentialists, for example, but they seem to come down to the idea that, apart from the philosophical debates, it seems real to most people. All right, and, and let's read about the philosophical debates, as you call them. The, the next sentence says, social constructionism suggests that there is nothing real about sexual orientation except a society's construction of it. Essentialism suggests that homosexual desire, identity, and persons exist as real in some form in different cultures and historical eras. Not surprisingly, social constructionists generally reject the possibility of biological factors in sexual orientation, while essentialists can accept but do not necessarily require biological factors, since we're looking to context. 
But do you believe that the, first of all, do you believe it would be reasonable to doubt whether sexual orientation is a valid concept at all? Well, what would you mean by valid? Just the words of the authors here. Well, do you mean, is there such a thing as sexual orientation? Does it actually exist? Uh, I guess that, is that what they, is that your interpretation of what they mean? I'm not sure. As I said, I haven't read this article for quite a long time. I think they come down saying that, um, as, as I said, they, they refer to these philosophical debates, that's their term, and they say most Americans, or North, North Americans, tend to label themselves according to sexual orientation. So in, in that sense, I, I think you would have to say it, it is a real construct. I mean, it, it's something that people actually um, experience and believe and can report about themselves. Do you believe uh, that the position that they describe as social constructionism, do you believe that is an unreasonable position? Well, you know, I think that they've, um, I, I realize they were doing this in a very summary fashion, but um, in a way this is, this is a statement of social constructionism that I think escapes or, or avoids some of the nuance to the constructionist view. Um, to say that, there's, that the social constructionists would suggest that there's nothing, quote, real about sexual orientation except a society's construction of it is um, really to minimize the importance of that construction. When social constructionists are talking about this, I, I think for most of them, and of course there are many different schools within that, that philosophical camp, but uh, I think generally when they're talking about this, they're referring to the cultural level. They're talking about the construction of these concepts at the cultural level in the same way that we have cultural constructions of race and ethnicity and social class. All of those are constructed socially. But, and so in a sense you can say there's nothing real about them in that these are not things that um, might be argued to exist in nature except for society's creation of them. But say there's no such thing as class or race or ethnicity or sexual orientation is to, I think, you know, minimize the importance of that. And, and again, the social constructionists are really speaking at that broad cultural level. Um, they are not saying, or at least I would say most of them are not saying that this is a process of the individual's construction of sexual orientation. Rather, they're talking about the way in which the culture uh, essentially um, defines how people view reality. All right, and it goes on to say that not surprisingly, social constructionists generally reject the possibility of biological factors in sexual orientation. Do you believe that the social, you compare, it said that for a social constructionist, it's the same thing as race or ethnicity. Do you think social constructionists would deny the, the uh, possibility of biological factors in race or ethnicity? Well, I think that most social constructionists would say for all of these things, including sexuality, that culture builds on the raw material. So, uh, and uh, I'm, you know, trying to characterize this very broad, complicated philosophical point of view, but I would say that social constructionists would say race is an entirely constructed category, although it is based on some physical characteristics, but the definition of what, which races are which, which ones are separate from each other, what type of skin coloring or what type of ancestry involves a person being of a particular race, um, all of those things are socially constructed. Uh, and, and I think they would say a similar thing about sexual orientation. Again, it doesn't mean that that individual personally constructs her or his racial identity or her or his sexual orientation in the sense of just making it up and it has no reality and it could change tomorrow. But I think that's, that's more consistent with what the social constructionists would argue. All right, let, let's turn to the next page, if we could, page five of the printout. And the... Under the a number of specific ideas are recommended at the bottom. In number one, it says, at this point in time, it seems to make the most sense to A, measure behavior and attraction fantasy separately. B, inquire about change evolution of erotic interests over time. And C, measure same and opposite sex orientation separately, not as one continuous variable. Do you believe that's an unreasonable statement? Do I believe it's unreasonable to follow that, those, to do that? Yes. Mm -hmm. to measure, oh, no, I think those, those are reasonable uh, suggestions for conducting empirical research on sexual orientation. One of the limitations is that, in, you know, that happens in the real world is sometimes you can't ask 
that many questions all at once in a particular survey. So it's not always feasible to do that, but I would say that depending upon the purpose of the study, these could be very relevant uh, approaches to take in measuring sexual orientation. All right, and, and please turn to page seven. And you will see at the bottom there is something called the cell scale of sexual orientation. And it starts on page seven and continues through page 11. I, I believe we have a four and a half page, 17 part, multiple subpart test for measuring sexual orientation. Uh, are, are you familiar with this test, the cell scale of sexual orientation? Uh, I've read about it. Do you believe it's a reasonable way to measure sexual orientation? I don't think very many people have actually used this because, as you said, it's an incredibly long instrument. I don't think it's proved to be a practical approach to, uh, to actually using in, in research. Do you believe it's reasonable? Well, part of reasonable is accuracy, is, is, um, uh, I'm sorry, not accuracy, but um, uh, just whether it's feasible, whether you know, it works, whether it's possible to do it. Um, so I don't think it's unreasonable to think that in an ideal sense it would be good to ask all of these questions, but I don't think very many researchers have actually used it uh, uh, in their, in their on-the-ground research. You think that's because they think it would be inaccurate or just impractical? I think it's, I think it's because, and I have to say I, I, I'm not uh, you know, a scholar on this, this scale. I haven't reviewed it intensively, but I believe it's because it, it's just typically um, too unwieldy to administer in a real-world setting. All right, thank you. And, Your Honor, I would like to introduce DIX 1266, uh, which is the document we've been discussing in the evidence. 1266 is admitted. All right, thank you. Please turn to tab 20 in the witness binder, if you would. Can you identify this document? <coughs> Well, it's the title page from the Handbook of Applied Developmental Science, Volume 1. Um, and if you could look inside, can you, uh, which I gather is a collection of, of works, and if you could look at the next page, mm -hmm. can you identify that? This is Chapter 5 uh, by Lisa Diamond and Rich Savin Williams, titled Gender and Sexual Identity. Thank you. And are, are you familiar with this document? I don't believe I've ever read this before. Are, are you familiar with Lisa Diamond? Uh, I certainly know who Lisa Diamond is, yes. She's a well-respected researcher, correct? Yes. Thank you. What, what about uh, Rich Savin Williams? Are you familiar with? Uh, Rich Savin Williams, like Lisa Diamond, is a developmental psychologist. Is uh, with a good reputation? I think that he is held in, in good repute, yes. All right, thank you. Please look at uh, page 102, that's the next page. And please look in the second column. You'll see in the first full paragraph there, and starting with the second sentence it reads, there is currently no scientific or popular consensus on the exact constellation of experiences that definitively qualify an individual as lesbian, gay, or bisexual rather than confused, curious, or maladjusted. Do you agree with that statement? Well, you know, I think we've gone over this a number of times, that, that there are these various approaches that we take to understanding sexual orientation in terms of attraction, behavior, and identity. I think it's relevant to note that this is a chapter that's published in the Handbook of Applied Developmental Science. And then, in fact, if you look at the beginning of this chapter, they're talking about uh, the experiences of very young people. Uh, uh, a 15-year-old boy who d uh, decided he was, or who, who started fantasizing about males at age 11, or a teenage girl who falls in love with her best female friend. So I think that they are especially concerned, and I'm guessing this because I haven't seen this chapter before, but knowing uh, both uh, Lisa Diamond's work and, and Rich Savin Williams' work to some extent, um, I would say that they're probably especially talking about the fact that for adolescents who are at a phase in their life when they're going through a lot of new experiences, and their identities of all sorts are forming, including their sexual identities, um, that it's especially difficult to talk about uh, uh, sexual orientation as being clearly defined for those adolescents. All right, well, what they say is there is currently no scientific or popular consensus on the exact constellation of experiences 
that definitively qualify an individual as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. Do you agree with that? Well, my understanding of the word consensus is that it means unanimity, and so I would agree. There is not unanimous agreement on this. Either popular or scientific. I'd be hard-pressed to find anything on which there's popular unanimity, but, uh, and in, in terms of science, as we've been discussing this already, I think, uh, you know, there are those different approaches. Okay, thank you. And the next sentence says, the more carefully researchers map these constellations, differentiating, for example, between gender identity and sexual identity, desire and behavior, sexual versus affectional feelings, early appearing versus late appearing attractions and fantasies, or social identifications and sexual profiles, the more complicated the picture becomes because few individuals report uniform intercorrelations among these domains. Do you agree with that statement? Well, I would disagree with the statement that few individuals report uniform, well, to be honest, the phrase report uniform intercorrelations among these domains is a bit confusing to me because you can't compute a correlation with just one person. It is something that only works when you're looking at groups and patterns in groups. But if what they mean by this is that few individuals are consistent across their attractions, their behaviors, and their desires, I would go back to what I've said earlier, which is that we know that uh, the vast majority of individuals are uh, consistent in those three areas, but there are some individuals who are not. <coughs> you believe the position that they state here is unreasonable? But you, you said you disagree with it. Do you believe it is unreasonable? Um, I believe that if I'm interpreting it correctly, and I, I allow for the fact, since I haven't read this whole article, um, there may be qualifications or explanations that I'm not familiar with, but I would say that if what this is intended to mean is that very few people demonstrate consistency in their attractions, behaviors, and identity, then I would say that that's not an accurate statement. I didn't ask you whether it was accurate. I asked you whether it was reasonable. Do you believe that's unreasonable? Well, I'm an a unreasonable scientist. View. I prefer, I try to think of things accurate as being reasonable. I guess it's not an unreasonable statement if you don't have data, but we do have data. So we know that there are these large numbers of people who are consistent across their identity, their behavior, and their uh, attraction. So that's where I'm going is, is by saying that uh, that's what's the accurate statement. All right. And, and do you believe this is outside of the mainstream of scholarship, that statement? Well, as I said, I haven't read the entire chapter, so it's quite possible that they will define some terms, explain some of these constructs in ways that I would then understand what they mean by this. So I, I would be hesitant to judge the statements of some of my colleagues having just read one or two sentences out of context. All right. Thank you. Your Honor, I would like to admit DIX, or ought to offer DIX 2682 for admission into evidence. Well, it's admitted. All right. Please turn to, pay, to tab 22 in the witness binder. And you'll find here a document uh, pre-marked DIX 935. Can you identify this document? Um, this is the title page of a book by Janice Bohan titled Psychology and Sexual Orientation, Coming to Terms, which was published in 1996. All right, and are you familiar with this work? Well, I am familiar with the book, yes. All right, thank you. And uh, please turn to page 13, which is the, the beginning page. I have to say my copy is not very good. It's rather faint. I, 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 just to let you know, it, it, it's a little bit fuzzy. I apologize. Can you, are you able to read it? Or? I, well, it's, I think so. But All yeah. right, I, I, I'm only going to read a little bit from this then. Okay. Uh, avoid straining your eyes unduly. In the very first line, it says, the concept of sexual orientation is not as straightforward as, every, as everyday conversations, media accounts, and political slogans would imply. Rather, the topic is fraught with vagaries, the terminology is ambiguous and ill-defined, and the apparently exclusive and stable categories commonly employed actually disguise complex dimensionality and fluidity. Do you believe that's an unreasonable statement? Well, I think it's probably reasonable. As she starts off uh, the, the first 
clause of the sentence is as suggested in the introduction. And I believe that in the introduction she laid out a number of examples that would illustrate what she is referring to. And um, again, I think that she, if, I haven't looked at this book for a long time, but as I recall, she probably was discussing examples in which there were inconsistencies between a person's identity and their behavior or their identity and their attractions, as we've been discussing. And, and so in that context, which I believe is the context in which she wrote this, I, I would say that that's a reasonable statement. All right, thank you. Your Honor, I'd like to offer DIX 935 for admission and evidence. <coughs> 935 is admitted. All right, thank you. And please turn to tab 25 in the witness binder, if you would. Now, you'll find here a document pre-marked DIX 1007. And this is a declaration submitted by Dr. Robert Gallitzer Levy. And I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that in, in a different case. And it was offered as a exhibit in this case by the city and county of San Francisco in their motion to, in, in support of their motion to intervene. Uh, are you familiar with Dr. Robert Gallitzer Levy? Um, I don't know him. Um, I, I've seen his name. I, I don't think I'm very familiar with his work. All right. Uh, I would like you to turn to page, uh, it's, well, there's two sets of pagination going by the pages at the bottom, which are the documents pagination, pages three and four and paragraph 10. At the bottom of the page three, uh, Dr. Galaxy Levy writes, the sexual orientation of any given individual falls within a spectrum between same gender orientation and opposite gender orientation. Nearly all heterosexual people are capable of some homosexual response, and nearly all homosexual people are capable of some heterosexual response. Hence, no sharp line distinguishes homosexuality and heterosexuality. Do you agree with that statement? Well, well let, let's take them apart. I, okay. That's kind of compound. Let's, let's take the first one. Do the, the sexual orientation of any given individual falls within a spectrum between same gender orientation and opposite gender orientation? Do you agree with that? Well, I think there he's referring to the Kinsey continuum that we've discussed already, that it is possible to think of sexuality as a continuum ranging from exclusive heterosexuality to exclusive homosexuality. All right, and then he says, nearly all heterosexual people are capable of some homosexual response, and nearly all homosexual people are capable of some heterosexual response. Do you agree with that statement? Well, the term, uh, I think the important term there is capable, um, meaning that it's at least uh, theoretically possible for all heterosexual people to have some homosexual response and nearly all homosexual people to have some heterosexual response. Um, and I can certainly allow that that seems like a reasonable uh, assumption to make. I don't know what specific research he would have been relying on to make that statement. I do know that when we look at studies like, for example, the Lauman study, um, it would suggest that um, uh, most people would say that they don't experience uh, and, and here again, the word is response. So does that mean attraction? Does that mean behavior? It's a little bit unclear. But uh, I think in studies like the Lauman study, we would um, uh, say that, that many people would say that they don't experience, for example, attraction to people of their same sex. Um, I, so I, I'm not completely certain what is meant here by a homosexual response or a heterosexual response. And what about the last sentence, hence no sharp line distinguishes homosexuality and heterosexuality? Well, I think that the key again, I, I may have mentioned something like this earlier, but he's using the words homosexuality and not heterosexuality, I'm sorry, homosexuality and heterosexuality. Um, and so while there may be, you know, it is the case that people who consider themselves to be heterosexual do consider there to be a, a clear line between their own sexual orientation and their attractions to behaviors with an identity based on that, uh, those attractions uh, toward people of the other sex. And whereas people who define themselves as gay or lesbian may very well see a very clear line between who they're attracted to and, and 
are in relationships with versus people of the other sex. Um, the, the general construct of heterosexuality and homosexuality, when conceptualized along this continuum, the nature of a continuum is that there is no clear, sharp line that separates it at any particular point. All right, thank you. And please turn to tab 26 in the witness binder, if you would. You'll find here a document pre-marked BIX 1268. Can you identify this document? Um, this is titled Lesbian Health, Current Assessment and Directions for the Future, edited by Andrea Solars. Uh, and published by the Committee on Lesbian Health Research Priorities at the Institute of Medicine. Thank you. Are you familiar with this document? Um, I'm familiar with it. I have not read this document. Uh, I, I know I've not read the entire document. I believe I may have read portions of the document. Uh, it was released about 10 years ago, and so I believe that sometime back around the time it was released, I may have read portions of it. All right, thank you. Please turn to page 23 of the document, if you would. In the introductory, there's a section called Introduction, you'll see on that page. And in the second paragraph, around the middle of the paragraph, there's a sentence that says, lesbians do not constitute an identifiable homogenous population for research study. Do you agree with that statement? Excuse me, I'm just trying to read the, the paragraph that it's in. Well, I think that their point is that the lesbian population is not a homogeneous population. Uh, as they say, some lesbians may belong to a community of women who self-identify as lesbians. Um, others may fear identifying as a lesbian despite having emotional and sexual partnerships with women owing to the potential stigma or negative consequences of that. Uh, and, and it goes on. And, and they also say diversity among lesbians also occurs along dimensions of race and ethnicity socioeconomic status, age, sorry, race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, age, whether or not they have children, and so on. And so in that sense, I think it is perfectly appropriate to say that lesbians do not constitute an identifiable homogeneous population for research study. Right. Now, they didn't just say uh, homogeneous or homogeneous. They said identifiable as well. Do you agree with the sentence as written with both of those adjectives? Well, as I said, I, if I've read this, it's been a long time, and so I'm not sure perhaps if they have spoken earlier about what they mean in terms of identifiable. Um, I believe that they may have talked about the difficulties of, um, uh, this was again written in the late 90s, but the difficulties of um, uh, believing that survey research will uh, that, that all women who are lesbian will uh, report that fact to a survey researcher because of the stigma and prejudice associated with being homosexual. Um, and so it's possible that this is what they mean by the difficulty of identifying lesbians. It may also go back to that different, <coughs> differing components of sexual orientation that we've been discussing over and over. Um, so, you know, with that qualification, I would say uh, that, you know, that that certainly would make sense. All right, thank you. And please read the first paragraph of the next section at the bottom of the page. Uh, well, I'll read it to you. It's views of sexual identity and sexual behavior can vary significantly across cultures and among racial and ethnic groups. So it should not be assumed that a lesbian sexual identity is the same for lesbians of different racial, ethnic, or cultural backgrounds. In particular, it should not be assumed that racial and ethnic minority cultures share views of lesbian sexual orientation identical with the dominant culture. Do you agree with that? Well, again, it's probably useful to go on further and to see that they're talking about um, the fact that within different racial and ethnic minority cultures, views about what is the family, the traditional views of family, predominant religions, traditional gender roles, all of these are things 
that uh, are likely to vary across different cultures. And so all of those things, I, I assume what they're getting to is that all of those things, since they vary across these different groups and all of those uh, I, uh, institutions and, and uh, traditions might be related to how one understands what uh, a lesbian identity would mean, uh, that's how you could have variation among racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds in terms of understanding what it means to be a lesbian. All right, and, and please turn to page 25 where it says how the committee defines lesbian. And, well, the, the first sentence, I'll skip, it says that numerous definitions have been suggested, and you can read that and see what it says. But starting with the second sentence, it says, in general, sexual orientation is most often described as including behavioral, affective, i.e. desires or attraction, and cognitive, i.e. identity dimensions, that occur along continua. That is, women may exhibit differing degrees of same-sex sexual behavior, desire, or identity in combinations that vary from person to person. Now, we've talked about these different components. Here it says that each of those components occurs along a continua, and that women may exhibit differing degrees of same-sex sexual behavior, desire, or identity in combinations that vary from person to person. Do you agree with that? Well, and, you know, who they cite here is Lauman et al., so we're back to those Venn diagrams. Uh, and, and so what they're, they're saying is, I assume, and again, I haven't read this in its entirety, but I assume that where they're going with this is to point to the same thing that we were talking about this morning of uh, there being groups that are consistent in terms of their identity, attraction, and behavior, but also some individuals that are not. And I would imagine that for their purposes, uh, they want to be as inclusive as possible, so they are going to consider all of these different dimensions in their report. All right, thank you. And please turn to page 33. And at the beginning of the second full paragraph on the page, they write, the committee strongly believes that there is no one right way to define who is a lesbian. Do <coughs> you agree with that? Well, I think this is what I was saying earlier. They go on to say that the, it's going to depend on the goal of your research study. So they say for a researcher designing a study on lesbian health, the recommended course is to develop measures that gather information about the aspects of, of lesbian orientation that are relevant to the specific project at hand. This is similar to what I was saying earlier. If you are, for example, studying sexually transmitted diseases, you would probably want a definition that focuses on sexual behavior. If you are studying the impact of experiences with discrimination, you would probably want a definition that focuses on identity. All right, they um, do. They, oh, excuse me, here you done. I, I think so. I was just going to say again, I'm at a, a certain disadvantage from not having read the entire thing and being able to, to talk about this in its context. Sure, thank, I, I understand. Thank you. Now, you, they do go on to say that sentence that you read, but, but let's read what they say right after that. They say, adopting this approach does not avoid the issue of lesbian definition. Rather, it builds on the need to accept the complexity of sexual orientation and the social context in which it is embedded. Do you disagree with that? Well, and again, I'd say read the next sentence. In essence, lesbians should be defined to meet the needs of specific research studies interventions or programs of care within generally accepted conceptual boundaries with recognition of the three dimensions through which sexual orientation is most often defined, identity, attraction or desire, and behavior. And, and I believe that's consistent with what I've been saying. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, I'd like to admit DIX, or offer to admit uh, DIX 1268 into evidence. 1268 is admitted. <coughs> All right, thank you. Please turn to tab 20, 27 in the, in the binder. Can you identify this document, Professor Eric? Um, this is a chapter by John Gonsiorek and James Weinrich titled The Definition and Scope of Sexual Orientation. And although it's not, oh, here it is. Uh, and this is from a uh, 1991 book titled Homosexuality, Research Implications for Public Policy. All right, thank you. And, Your Honor, this is pre-marked P2, 
PIX 912 or PX 912, and I believe it was on the list of exhibits that plaintiffs offered this morning. It is. Thank you. Now, please look at page two. And you discuss in the, or not, the authors, excuse me, discuss in the middle of the first column. There's a discussion about the words lesbian, gay, as opposed to homosexual. And then skipping to where it's to the sentence, the fourth sentence, it says, it can be argued that the words gay and lesbian really describe a particular identity that goes beyond mere description, is not accurate for many homosexually behaving and desiring individuals, and is primarily rooted in the social political context of the mid and late 20th century Western world. Do you see that? Yes. I believe that's an unreasonable statement? Well, you know, I believe this is the same statement, almost verbatim, that um, the, John Gonciorek, the author of this paper, was also uh, one of the authors of the paper we discussed a few exhibits ago in Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior in that journal. Uh, and I believe that this is roughly the same thing that he said there, uh, uh, talking about, uh, you know, concerns about uh, terminology. Um, so I, I would say it is accurate that you can make that argument. It can be argued that the words gay and lesbian really describe a particular identity that goes beyond mere description, meaning that it's not simply a descriptive term um, as they would, I assume, would say the word homosexual is more of a descriptive term, uh, describing simply a type of sexual attraction or behavior. Um, it could be argued that it is not accurate for many homosexually behaving and desiring individuals. Um, and we've talked about the Lauman and Gagnon study repeatedly. Uh, and it's primarily rooted in the sociopolitical context of the mid and late 20th century Western world, although the use of both words to describe homosexuality has a venerable history. Uh, and there again, I think that's consistent with what we've been saying along. So I would say the, the statement that all of those positions can be argued is, is all right, thank you. And at the paragraph at the bottom of that page, uh, again, uh, it starts with bisexual. It says, bisexual experience is common both historically and currently among individuals who self-identify as lesbian or gay. A cross-cultural study of male homosexuals in the United States, Holland, and Denmark, I'll skip the citation, you can read that, found that 36% to 59% of homosexual individuals studied, depending on the country, had had heterosexual intercourse. Yet these men thought of themselves as gay and were drawn from gay communities. Uh, do those statistics surprise you? Well, they cite the Weinberg and Williams 1974 book, and it's been a while since I've looked at that book, but my recollection is that uh, it was not based on a probability or a representative sample in any of those countries, but rather these were samples, we sometimes call them convenient samples, but samples that are not, whose representativeness of the larger population remains unknown. Um, so I would be very careful in looking at the proportions here, but I would also say that it is, I think, uh, the case that most people are brought up in society assuming that they will be heterosexual. Little boys are taught that they will grow up and marry a girl. Little girls are taught they will grow up and marry a boy. And growing up with those expectations, it is not uncommon for people to engage in sexual behavior with someone of the other sex, possibly before they have developed their real sense of who they are, of what their sexual orientation is. And I think that's one of the uh, reasons why we do see that among lesbians and gay men, it is not uncommon for individuals to report that at one point in their lives they did experience heterosexual intercourse, although it is not part of their identity, it's not part of who they are, uh, and not uh, indicative of their current attractions. All right, thank you. And, and indeed, uh, you mentioned lesbians as well, and the next sentence says, the sexual experience of lesbians is at least as diverse, and probably more so, with estimates of 81% and 74% respectively. I, I gather respectively because they're citing two studies there. 
of lesbian women who had engaged in heterosexual intercourse. Uh, again, are, do those statistics uh, surprise you in any way? Or you well, once again, I don't believe they're citing data from representative samples. So these would be the percentages of women in those particular samples. And oh, I, I believe the respect, yes, I was puzzled too by that word respectively. And I believe that one statistic goes with the Bell and Weinberg study. One statistic goes with the Rhinish et al. study. Um, but again, I would just point out that uh, the actual percentages uh, are not something we can generalize to the larger population, but it is certainly consistent with what, I'd say, what I was saying. And in fact, I, I would agree with them that it may be even more likely for women to have experienced uh, heterosexual intercourse, uh, partly because of the status of women in society and the fact that young women are often uh, pressured in many ways to marry heterosexually, perhaps uh, before they have really developed a sense of their own sexual orientation. All right, thank you. And, and on the next page, they write uh, the first full paragraph, cultural factors are also relevant. Many societies do not conceptualize diversity in sexual behavior along dimensions of homosexual, heterosexual at all. In some cultures, in some cultural ethnic groups, both in and outside the Western world, same-sex behavior is not seen as homosexual orientation, which is defined instead by social sex role or, partic or participation in specific sexual acts. Do you agree with that? That there are cultures in which engaging in same-sex behavior is not seen as equivalent to a homosexual orientation? Would I agree with that? Yes. I, I would agree with that. All right, thank you. And uh, Your Honor, I'd like to uh, offer, well, actually, this is already in the record. Uh, please turn to tab 27A in the witness binder. And here you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 658. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting this up. 27A. Got it upside down, OK. Do you see that? Um, say the number again, please. It's uh, 27A, yes. and it's DIX 65A. Yes. Can you identify this document? Um, this is an article from the journal Pediatrics from 1992 by several authors. The first one is Gary Remafetti, and it is titled Demography of Sexual Orientation in Adolescence. All right, thank you. And are, are you familiar with this? Well, this is another one that I suspect I read back in the early 90s. Uh, I'm not sure if I've looked at it more recently. All right, thank you. Please turn to page 719 and look at the second column under the discussion. Uh, it reads, the first sentence reads, sexual orientation has been defined as a consistent pattern of sexual arousal towards persons of the same and or opposite gender, encompassing fantasy, conscious attractions, emotional and romantic feelings, sexual behaviors, and possibly other components. Then the next sentence goes on to say, since the heterosexual or homosexual direction of the individual dimensions may be at variance with one another, with another Numerous permutations of orientation are possible and probable in human populations. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, do you agree that the individual dimensions of sexual orientation may be at variance with one another for an well, individual? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, for, for, go ahead. Well, as I've been saying, uh, the data indicate that for most people they are not, but for some people they are. Okay. And do you believe that numerous permutations of orientation are possible and indeed probable in human populations? Well, I think this is where we might go back to that Klein grid where they had the 21 different squares that people could fill in. Uh, there's, a, there's a very complex set of combinations you could, withdraw, you could draw from that, uh, those 21 boxes. It turns out that when factor analyses of that grid have been done, um, they boil down to uh, in terms of sexuality, at least one major underlying dimension. So I would say that in theory, it would seem that you could have 
uh, a very large number of permutations and combinations. Um, but in reality, uh, that's probably not very common, uh, that most people do in fact maintain or do report some consistency in these different dimensions of their sexual orientation. All right, uh, Your Honor, I'd like to offer DIX 658. Hearing no objection, 658 is admitted. All right. Now, Professor Herrick, I, I would like to discuss whether, as a matter of fact, sexual orientation does change over time for some individuals. And, and now, some people do experience considerable fluidity in their sexual orientation throughout their lives, correct? Some people experience change and fluidity over the course of their lives. Uh, this is something that happens apparently spontaneously with the individual as opposed to uh, some intervention being done to make the individual change. But we do know that, that these changes do occur in, in some people's lives. All right, thank you. And for purposes of right now, I, I'm not particularly interested in discussing the intervention aspect versus other causes, but just whether as a fact changes do occur. So uh, some research data suggests that women are somewhat more likely to perceive their sexuality as fluid and involving some degree of choice, correct? Um, yes, I think that when we look at women's histories, uh, we do more often see uh, the idea that they're, they're um, romantic relationships and their experiences of sexuality uh, are more likely to change or change in more women than is the case for men over the course of their lives. All right, thank you. Now, on your, uh, direct, in your direct testimony, you discussed studies that you conducted in which you found that a great many gay men and lesbians felt that they experienced either no choice at all or very little choice about their sexual orientation, correct? That's correct. All right, and in these studies, you collected data using sexual identity as opposed to sexual attraction or sexual behavior, correct? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I completely understand the question. How did you identify the sample of the individuals that you asked the question oh. to? They were self based on self-identity, were they not? I see. Okay, well, these were, um, there was a multiple stage process of, uh, of obtaining the sample. Um, this was from a, uh, uh, a survey organization that has uh, basically recruited a very large number of participants to take part in internet research and has provided them with the equipment to do that if they didn't already have it. Um, they have asked the participants in their panel in this large group many demographic questions, one of which was, are you, I may not be getting the wording exactly right, but it was something to the effect of, are you lesbian, gay, or bisexual? And so if they had answered yes to that question, um, they were uh, considered eligible for participation in one of the studies that I did, the one that I was talking about earlier. Um, in that study, there was then an initial uh, series of screening questions that asked them about their sexual orientation. Um, and in terms of um, it, it was, we basically gave them five categories. One, and it, the questionnaire was tailored to the specific sex of the individual. But I'll tell you, for example, the one directed at men. It would ask them if which of the following best described them, uh, gay or homosexual, uh, bisexual, mainly attracted to men, bisexual, equally attracted to both men and women, bisexual, mainly attracted to women, heterosexual or straight. So in that sense, it really was a bit of a combination of identity labels and uh, patterns of attraction. Okay, but your, uh, your initial pool from which you drew were all self-identified, indivi individuals who self-identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, correct? They had said yes to the question I described. Um, one thing that we came to realize was that, especially for the bisexual individuals, it's possible that they interpreted that they could have interpreted that as a, a question about their patterns of attraction or behavior as well as identity. Okay, thank you. And you relied on self-reporting in this in these surveys, correct? Correct. All right, thank you. And these studies did not ask any questions that went to whether people's sexual orientation had changed, correct? That's correct. And so these studies do not really shed any light on this question, correct? 
on, on the question of whether people's sexual orientation had changed? No, we, we did not ask questions about that. Okay, thank you. And if you were trying to predict for any specific individual whether their identity will predict their sexual behavior in the future, that can be problematic, correct? I think that if we are talking about general patterns, again, if I were a betting person, I would say that you would do well to bet that their future sexual behavior will correspond to their current identity, but you should also realize that for some individuals that would not be the case. All right, thank you. Uh, please turn to tab two in your binder. Okay. And this is a transcript of your deposition. Uh, and I, I'd like you to turn to page 105. That's the deposition page. And the page, the bottom of the, of the page is 27. There's four pages per page, so it's a little complicated, but. Okay, say the page again, please. The, the page at the bottom of the, uh -huh. is 27, and the deposition page is 105. <clears throat> and I'd like you to look at lines 15 through 18 on, on that page. It's uh, page 105 in the deposition. The 27 is just the page at the bottom. Uh, all right. Did, now, have you had a chance to look at those lines? Yes. Did, did you give that testimony at your deposition? Yes. Okay, and I, I'd like to read that, Your Honor. He said, Now that said, if you are trying to predict for any specific individual whether their identity will predict their sexual behavior in the future, especially, that can be problematic. All right, thank you. And... Uh, we certainly know that people report that they have experienced a change in their sexual orientation at various points in their life, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, could you say the question one more time? Sorry. Uh, we certainly know that people report that they have experienced a change in their sexual orientation at various points in their life, correct? Some people do report that, yes. Okay. Thank you. But we don't know why in every case people who have experienced a change in their sexual orientation at some point in their life exactly why that happened in every case, correct? That's correct. All right, thank you. And people do not always have a knowledge of their, mel of their mental processes, correct? Um, that's true. We see that uh, especially in social psychological studies that have looked at prejudice. Uh, and it's been repeatedly documented that people are not always aware of their prejudices and biases. And so if you ask them about it, they cannot tell you um, exactly what what's going on, but then other other measures have shown that they do, in fact, have those prejudices and biases. All right, thank you. So you agree that people don't always have a knowledge of their mental processes? I do. Okay, thank you. Please turn to uh, page 27C in the witness binder. Yeah, 27. 27C. And, Your Honor, I, there's, I want to bring... I want, this is a transcript of portions of the deposition testimony of Ms. Steer, the oh, plaintiff in the case. Oh. Um. And okay. this deposition was provisionally designated as confidential, and plaintiffs had 30 days to designate those portions of the deposition that they wished to retain that classification. And they didn't do so. And uh, I, I would like to read some of this into the record, but I, I think the parts I'm planning to read are not sensitive. But if there are any concerns, I, I don't have any objection to clearing the courtroom and turning off the camera, if that's what you would like to do. Well, I'll, shall I identify, identify the line numbers? Which portions you would yes, I, I would. I'll identify them. And then the, the lines I'm going to read are page 22, 11 through 15, 24, 5 through 11, Oh, excuse me, 22, 11 through 15, 24, 5 through 11, and 198, 24 through 199, 3. So there's just three passages, so I'll break them up a little. Last again, 199. 198, 24 through 199, 3. <coughs> it is... 
Uh, Your Honor, if I could ask a question to opposing counsel through through the court. Is is there any objection to my reading these portions of the transcript? Scott Meyer? All right. And while they're looking, I will note that I, I believe these are not particularly sensitive and, in fact, are pardon. quite similar. Oh, I said, Your Honor, while they're looking, I, I, I will note that I believe I was careful to try and pick things that I don't believe are particularly sensitive, and I believe they're quite similar to plaintiff's testimony in open court. Right. You may proceed. Thank you. All right. Uh, Professor Herrick, are you uh, aware that Ms. Steer was previously married to a man? Um, I believe I was aware of that, yes. All right. Thank you. And if you look at uh, deposition transcript, page 22, 11, lines 11 and 12, she said, the, the witness, which is Ms. Steer, 